In 1805, the emperor addressed to the same sovereign the following words, the world is large enough for two nations to live in, and reason is abundantly able to find the ways of conciliating everything. If only there is on both sides the will. Peace is the wish of my heart. But war has never been contrary to my glory. I conjure your majesty not to deny himself the happiness of voluntarily granting peace. In 1808, Napoleon united with Alexander to bring over the British cabinet to ideas of conciliation. Finally, in 1812, when the emperor was at the apogee of his power, he made again the same propositions to England. He always sued for peace after a victory, never after a defeat. A nation said he could replace men more easily than honor. It would be too sad an idea to think that war had been kept up only through the revengeful passions or the interests of parties. If an obstinate contest continued for so long a time, it was doubtless because the two nations understood each other too little, and each government erred as to the real condition of its neighbor. England saw, perhaps, in Napoleon only a despot who oppresses his country and exhausts all her resources to gratify his warlike ambition. She could not recognize that the emperor was the elect of the people of whom he represented all the interests, material and moral, for which France had contended since 1789. It may also be held that the French government confounding the enlightened aristocracy of England with the feudal aristocracy which weighed upon France before the revolution thought that it was dealing with an oppressive government but the english aristocracy is like de Bruyere's fable it has a hold upon the people by a hundred thousand roots it obtained from them as many sacrifices as napoleon obtained efforts from the french nation and it is worthy of notice in the contest between these two countries that the rivalry of england placed napoleon at one time in a position to realize against that power european project similar to that which Henri the fourth would have put in execution against Spain if the steel of a base assassin had not deprived France and Europe of that great monarch. We shall return in another chapter to a consideration of the morality of the end which the emperor designed to attain. Let us examine now the principal improvements which he introduced into foreign countries, very differently from other governments which have always treated the provinces they have acquired like conquered countries. The emperor caused all the nations of which he was master to participate in the benefits of an enlightened administration, and the countries which he incorporated with France enjoyed from that instant the same prerogatives as the mother country. When he gave crowns, he imposed always two conditions upon the king whom he appointed, the inviolability of the constitution and the guarantee of the public debt. In Italy, he formed a great kingdom which had its separate administration and its Italian army. All the administrative and judicial offices were filled by natives. The troops were no longer composed of mercenaries and the dregs of the population. Every man was called upon to defend his country. The army became citizen. The sovereign could no longer dip, according to his caprice, into the public treasury. He had his civilist, feudalism, tithes. Mortmans and monastic orders were destroyed. A constitutional statute established three colleges. First, proprietors. Second, those engaged in commerce. Third, the learned. There were added to the first two colleges, which required for admissibility the qualification of the payment of a certain amount of imposts. The third college, free from that requisition, composed under the name of the College of Savants of 200 citizens chosen from among the most celebrated men of all branches of science or of the liberal or mechanic arts, or from among those who had most distinguished themselves, whether by their doctrines in ecclesiastical matters or by their acquisitions in legislation, morals, politics, or administration, the citizens were organized into a national guard, the country divided into departments and administered by prefectures, by sub-prefectures, 
temperatures lost that provincial spirit which is the death of nationality new laws concerning property and mortgages simplified administration and enriched the country agriculture the sciences and the arts were encouraged the french code was introduced and publicity of proceedings in criminal matters was declared houses of industry were erected in several cities to put an end to mendicity convents were converted into hospitals justices of the peace were appointed and the decimal system of money ways and measures was established public instruction was regulated by a law which divides it economically into three degrees national departmental and communal and scientifically likewise into three degrees transcendental intermediate and elementary above all stood the national institute the italian concordat protected the temporal power from the encroachments of the ecclesiastical power the various bonds of the people of italy were drawn closer by more easy means of communication the alps were leveled and the apennines cut by new roads united piedmont to the mediterranean italian glory awoke and for the first time since caesar italian legions were seen to tread as conquerors of the soil of spain the name of italy so beautiful dead for so many ages was restored to provinces which until then had been severed that name implies in itself a future of independence